so the basic the talk is all about building real time applications real time web which is essentially the future as many would say now why is it the future so to understand the future we'll have to look into the history first the web started as a as a medium to serve static content on the internet internet existed much before the web started it just meant serving html documents nothing more than that and some people thought well these static documents are not, are not of much use uh, there should be some dynamic stuff so server side dynamic content came there was cgi perl uh, then java came php many languages came in 95 another language came javascript but the intent was different uh, it wanted to introduce dynamic behavior in the browser itself so good so so far so good new thing came along ajax and the whole scene completely changed we saw gmail uh, we saw the new yahoo mail how single page applications were possible you didn't have to change your page to change content but that's not enough uh, that's okay for 2005 we are in 2011 now we have to go real time and that's where web sockets come in and that's what this whole talk is about building real time applications using web sockets what exactly is real time before i go further i mean i'm i'm sure pretty much every one of you uses gmail right and there is a gtalk pop up window at the bottom where you can chat chat on do you ever wonder when you type a message in it it happens all in real time you you say hi to someone he gets a message instantly in the classical ajax methods you had to poll is there a message is there a message but that would be a insane amount of traffic for the server they managed to serve that amount of traffic but not through a classic polling me mechanism what they do is server push sounds fancy a lot of people have been doing it uh, what is it we'll go further and see what is the web socket thing so what exactly is web socket is you guys would know tcp right and you have used probably a lot of tcp clients um, messengers and irc clients and chat clients and blah blah i mean essentially they let you do bidirectional communication over tcp right but on web you couldn't do that on web you needed a very traditional model where the client sent a request and the server sent a response and there was no equality between them the server couldn't say hey client take this data client had to request for data first what happens in web socket now is we're trying to break that limit we're trying to create a system in which the client can pull data as well as the server can push data so it's bidirectional and a full duplex communication channel cool well it can be used for multiplayer games i'm sure you've seen a lot of facebook games uh, you see uh, let's say you're building a snake game and you kind of trying to mix it up with tron the so two snakes run around and hit each other you can do that all real time using web sockets you can use it for live and instant updates use google plus google plus gives you updates pretty instantly as soon as something happens that's all through web sockets or i fall back for that we'll see that later the good part is they are available for pretty much most modern browsers so if you want to use them they're pretty much there you have to just start using them and they're pretty awesome so what is the code look like what you do is uh, you just say my new web socket and you give a url to the web socket url um, it could be http it could be ws depends on uh, what you're using and then you say when the connection opens do something when you get a message do something when you close do something it's not a lot i mean don't go into details here just uh, just to show you what you actually would write uh, when maybe in 2015 okay because of the things we'll see later you cannot do this today there's a lot of problems with it there's a good browser support firefox 4 chrome safari 5 i10 opera 11 but a lot of you use um, ies also i6 i7 i8 and there's firefox 3 3.6 firefox 2 there's chrome 4 there's opera 9 10 and there's plethora of web browsers out there including the suckiest android browsers you just cannot use them there and you cannot tell your clients please use a better browser you just cannot or a better phone you just cannot tell them so you have to support all of that 
That's why you cannot use the web sockets right now. Another problem. Even if your browser supports web sockets, there are currently six drafts. There is draft uh, 6, draft 7, draft 10, draft 76, draft 77, and each of them is different. I wrote an application two days back, and Chrome updated to draft 10, and it's broken. There are web sockets. I'm not using any older technology. I'm using web sockets, and it's still broken. So even in the modern browsers, you cannot write consistent code. It's a pain. It won't be in a couple of years, but it is right now. Another thing, if you're using Firefox, then you have to use vendor prefixes, but that's okay. You can put a check for that. And if you use the earlier drafts of WebSockets, there were loopholes which could be used as exploits. So all no-go. We cannot use this right now. We just cannot. What you can do is wait for a couple of years. But that doesn't sound sane. I mean, Gmail is using it. Google Plus is using it. Facebook is using it. Everybody is using it. Twitter is using it. We have to use it, right? Well, there are a few methods you can use as fallback. Uh, there are a couple of things that have been using, uh, people have used for almost about seven years now. Uh, there's something called Comet D. There's a Bayex protocol, there's a Bosch protocol, there's an Ajax push engine. They all let you do all this stuff. They use older technologies to simulate WebSockets. They're not pretty good, but they have a good support. But the only problem is they're quite fragmented. If you're using Comet, you can push data. But it's not actually a... a full duplex, bi-directional communication channel. It's just server pushing data. For chats, you want bi-directional. I, I want to send data, I want to receive data from the server. So they're okay, they're not great. Uh, they all use fallbacks like XHR polling, iframes, or flash-based WebSocket. Well, it doesn't really matter for the details here. And a lot of people have been using them. I'm sure you, you pretty much come across all of these, uh, at least one of them, uh, every day, I'm sure. Uh, so we've been doing this for, for like six years, seven years, and why do we need WebSockets now, right? I mean, people have been working on it, it's working great, everyone's happy. Why should we even worry about WebSockets? Well, you guys have, uh, did you, anyone if you ever do rounded corners back in 2003? Or 2004? Um, cool. Did any one of you did box shadows or opacity back in 2000, 2004? Yeah, so these things were painful to do before through hacks, but now they have been standardized. The same is true for WebSockets. Bidirectional channels were not there, but server push was always been there. So why not standardize it? Why write 20 KB of code to do something when your browser can implement it, and we can just start using it? Reduces the costs, money-wise, effort-wise, man-hour-wise. It's good. So we actually do need uh, web sockets. So all the solutions we know are currently hacks. So let's say if somebody using XHR polling, they they fire an XHR request and they wait until a response comes, essentially blocking the servers they're using, unless they're using an evented I/O thing, which most of them don't. Uh, they have their own benefits, they have their own issues. Let's not get into the details here. Few of them are scalable, few of them are not. Like Comedy doesn't scale, it's based on Java code which spawns threads. Painful. So again, as I said, let's just standardize it and get it over with. Why should we even worry about this? Just standardize it. Cool. Standardizing, putting in every browser saves money, time, everyone's happy. But there's a small pain. Who standardizes it? ECMA, W3C, what WGG, what WG? Problem with them, these standard bodies take ages. It will take years to standardize anything. 2022 would be the, the year of HTML5. We can't wait till then. We just can't. So we need some kind of a, a very simple API that just manages all of this for us. Comet is good, Bex is good, Bosch is good, but they're just way too complicated. So let's just write a wrapper API which takes care of all this. It's simple, one, probably resembles a WebKit, uh, WebSocket API. Two, if WebSocket is available, it directly uses it. That's most important. Should use native when available. Fallbacks to the next best transport. So if 
uh, you're using a system which has Flash support, use Flash-based WebSockets. You can implement WebSockets through Flash, which is bidirectional, by the way. If you use XHR polling, it won't be bidirectional. And most importantly, use a solution which can scale well on the server side. Imagine writing a chat application and your server cannot handle more than 1,000 connections. We are talking about persistent connections here. 1,000 people on your site, 1,000 connections. You cannot do that with your typical web servers. You need specialized web servers, evented web servers for this. So let's use something. Let's use Socket.io. I mean, we aren't the first ones figuring out this problem. People have been figuring this out for a couple of years. They have solved this quite well, actually. Uh, what Socket.io does is it gives you a very consistent API across client and the server. So I'll read it through. Um, one, it uses WebSockets when available, which is pretty much most browsers. It sees for the drafts that are implemented. If it's a draft 76, which you don't have to know, if it's draft 76, it operates on draft 76. If it's draft 10, it drop, operates on draft 10. You don't have to worry about it. Your code will keep working. When the browsers upgrade, you don't worry about it. Socket.io takes care of that. That's what we want. We don't have to worry about managing our code on these trivial things. So it's good. Secondly, it works on even IE 5.5. I'm sure not a lot of you have clients who use IE 5.5, but still, IE 6 people, I mean, there are quite a lot of them in India at least, right? So another good point. Third, if you write JavaScript, I'm sure you will have to write JavaScript for the client side. Using socket.io's node client, you use pretty much same code on the server side. And since it's bi-directional programming, I mean, if we're talking about bi-directional communication, the, the code is pretty much the same. So it's very easy to learn. If you learn one side, you don't have to mess around the other side. Unlike Comet D or Bayux or Bosch, where you write JavaScript on the client side and you go worrying about the server side. It's a completely different language out there, right? And if any of you are Erlang fans or Python fans, you have clients available for socket.io in those languages as well. So it's not a problem if you don't have to switch a language. And since it, uh, if you use the Node socket, um, Node.js socket.io client, evented I.O., highly extensible, uh, highly extensible because socket.io lets you create extensions, highly scalable. You can have 10,000 clients at the same time, just fine. You can have 20,000, just fine. 100,000, just fine. Of course, it depends on the servers you're using. I'm guessing on production servers, you have good resources. So, Node.js plus Socket.io for the win. This is what the server-side code looks like. You just say, um, don't go much into the syntax. You just say, on connection, this is my callback. On the connection, I just took this code from the Socket.io website, so I can just explain it. You just say, on the connection, just emit a news message saying, hello world. Somebody on the other side of the um, world in a browser will be saying um, socket.on news console.log, whatever data is there. Like this, console.on news. So whatever you emit here, the event goes with the data to the client. I'm sure nobody will disagree that this is really simple. I mean, this is a piece of cake compared to what you have to do if you have to handle all the WebSocket shit that's out there. It's really painful. This takes care of everything. Works on an Android 1.6 phone, works on i5.5, works pretty much everywhere. You have a use case where you need to uh, write real-time applications. This is what you need. Okay, I was supposed to show you a demo, but I can show you a demo. I, was work I didn't finish it. I was just working on the slides in the last session. Uh, so in the code, I have put two handlers saying, on slash next, emit a event called next. OK. I say, so this is using Express. There's an application which is serving this. I just said, whenever I hit the web server with slash next, on all sockets, emit a event called next. When I say previous, emit previous everywhere. OK. Understandable? Please, any responses? OK. And in my main code, at the bottom I say, socket.on next, I just say, document or trigger next. And on this event, I am actually sliding the slideshow. So what I can do is, this is my slideshow, I can send a next. 
and it just slides. I can say prev and just goes to the previous one. Oh, oh sure. Is it visible now? Now? Actually much better. Yeah. So if I say previous on this, the HTTP handler is broadcasting to everybody who's opening this slide right now. Actually, I can push this code to one of my servers. Anybody using internet here? No you have, right? Or this one person? Okay. So, so I can probably demonstrate it later to you. So this is, act, and this is actually running on one of the servers as well. So if you guys would have opened the website right now, and I would have hit the URL, you would have actually seen the slideshow moving. I was, what I was trying to do was, if I, when I move the slides, the slide moves on your screen, which is probably, if you give me half an hour, I can do that. It's pretty much just 10 minutes of work. It's not that hard. Um, yeah. Yeah. You can say, you can namespace your events. Um, you can namespace your clients. You can send it per client ID also. Um, I mean, there are many ways you can deal with it. There are many use cases, and this is quite a mature project, and they've handled all the use cases. Uh, cool. Next. Let me slide through the command line. Demo is done. Q&A. The session was quite fast. Now I need 20 minutes of Q&A. You said the chat can handle thousands of Do you have some benchmark for how much bandwidth So the thing is, uh, since the messages are really small, right? The what it involves is when you, uh, when one person sends it, you just brought, uh, send it to the other person, right? It doesn't involve much of uh, RAM because you're not spawning threads here. Node.js does it in a sync way. The system manages the thread, so you're not increasing any amount of RAM. Very negligible, pretty much null. Okay. Like, yeah. I mean, I have benchmarked on my machine, on I have a 512 MB machine, and I benchmarked using AB, and it was fine on 100,000. Get requests. So on get requests, I was broadcasting. I cannot do uh, the WebSocket broadcast through AB. And I can do get requests. So I did like 10,000 get requests. Each of them broadcasted something. That's the beauty of async IO, right? I mean, if you're not doing a lot of uh, memory allocation, you're not doing any kind of blocking, you don't, I mean, it's perfect. It doesn't take any resources. I mean, there are benchmarks which say if Node.js does 10,000, Erlang probably does uh, 50,000. So if you're an Erlang guy, go ahead. I mean, there are Erlang clients for socket.io. Please use them. They are, they're really great. You don't have to stick to Node.js. This talk is not about Node.js. It's about building real-time applications. And socket.io is our current resort. I mean, that's we have to resort to because the web socket situation is really, really broken right now. Yeah, so let's say, I mean, socket.io is only because it's taking care of all the abstraction. Let's talk about benefits of using web sockets. Let's say you want to do some kind of server push uh, in the older methods. You do a request, right, first. But that's the only other way, right? Server push or web socket. So in a traditional model, you when you request, you send a huge chunk of headers, your cookies, your domain information, plenty of it. Right now, I'm just trying to send a hello world message. Why should I be sending some 2 KB of data? It doesn't make any sense, right? On WebSockets, you're just sending what you need. One, two, uh, when you're doing, no matter what uh, kind of server push you use, what polling you use, there'll always be a little delay because you cannot keep consistently uh, requesting, right? On WebSockets, the server is pushing the moment it gets the data. So you are, the, the, the client is not current, the, the firing network request every three seconds, every five seconds is insane because and DNS is slow, then there are network latencies. When you have a persistent connection, the communication is much, much faster. And since the size is small, it's even much faster. Any unit testing, uh, Pardon? Any unit testing for, I mean, if I want to do unit tests for, so you can kind of uh, mock the web sockets uh, that the class itself. 
I haven't found any, but I mean, it wouldn't be very hard if you want to. It won't be. Yeah, but, but they, and, I mean, he's talking about testing the WebSocket itself. When you say new WebSocket, this URL, this, you should probably mock it, right? Yeah. No, there is no test available, I mean, test uh, frameworks available for socket IO per se. I mean, it's not I have come across. So you can actually pass um, session information along. There is a session module uh, which sends uh, like a session ID and all. So the first time you want to authenticate, do, you do it over HTTP. Once you do that, the client will probably send out a token saying, this is, this is me. On the server side, you get uh, the client ID. And you can map the session ID with the client ID. After that, it's pretty easy. Yeah, it's a persistent connection. If there are any glitches, the browser will probably try to reestablish. Okay, so there is some limit, right? How many connections the browser can keep open? Yeah, that is a per domain limit is there. Um, some browsers have four, some browsers have two. That's only for HTTP. This this is an extension of HTTP 1.1. It actually violates HTTP 1.1. So it's not it's not essentially strict HTTP 1.1. It violates it, so it doesn't uh, stick to that rule. You can have 20 connections to a same domain, it's fine. Even in that case, I mean, can you tell me a situation in where you'd be actually establishing more than four um, requests to same domain? Why not just, I mean, it's essentially a stream. Why not just push data over the same stream? Even if it's XSR polling, why not request data in chunk? Yeah, yeah. I mean, depends. I mean, uh, you can have some persistent connections for some real-time updates, like um, uh, there's a new mail or there's a message. But fetching all the mail information via WebSockets, that's kind of a little too far, too far-fetched. Yeah. I don't think WebSockets actually sticks to that uh, limit, so probably the older ones, yeah. But again, then it's not a very long-lasting connection, right? When you do a polling request, um, it dies out in certain time. It doesn't try to keep it open for like half an hour, even if there's no message. Okay. So it dies out so that if anybody else might request for the same domain, it might be alive. Yeah. You are not audible. Can you be louder? So you, if you want to send binary data, you'll have to serialize it. I mean, you can serialize in Base64 is the most common thing that people do. I and mean, you don't really need to deal with much binary data, at least till today. I mean, there are a few ways, but you don't really deal with them today, right? Like you have to send some binary From the browser? So anyways, whenever you, not in this situation, any, any situation when you have to send binary data over network, you serialize it in a safe way. Uh, Base64 or anything like that would do just fine. Any more questions? Yeah, so if you're using Chrome Debugger, uh, all the old, if you're using old versions of Chrome or WebKit or Safari, it will show you those XHR polling requests. If uh, your draft version doesn't match with Socket IO draft version, um, if you again see the XHR polling request. But if you actually using WebSockets, there's a tab for WebSockets in Chrome now. So you can actually see the WebSocket requests also there. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you want to locally debug it, I mean, I mean, you debug it just like any other node application. You just start node with a minus debug flag. You do use the node inspector and just debug use again. I10 actually does. I9 doesn't. No, no. So socket.io is a library that works on top of node. Yeah, yeah. So um, you, you can what you can do is you could go to the GitHub page for socket.io 
uh, in the tags, you can see each version and you can probably go and see the package files. The package file mentions the minimum node version required. So new ones run on 0.47 and above only because there are a lot of event emitter changes in the late, latest node.io. The event handling is completely changed in the latest code. And it will be very different in the once 0.6 get released. Very, very different. Uh, I didn't understand the last part. Can you be louder? So, I'm saying that this is basically a broadcast mechanism, right? So, each time it's a different emitter something, all the listening sites would go to that particular So, for the listening sites, there's one to one communication where like, each time, like, on a certain limit, or like, on a certain law, it goes into a different state. Like, what is the strategy? So, you're saying instead of doing a broadcast, you want to do one on one communication? That's what your question is? Yeah. So that, that's what I was on. I was showing you here. What I did was I did io.sockins.emit, which means that broadcast to everyone. But this is not the only one you communicate in socket.io or in web sockets. Um, when you when you establish a connection, this is there's a method called io.sockets.on connection, and you get a client object here. So you can actually store the client IDs and all. You can create a map somewhere in memory, and you can use that to broadcast or to send out to a group or individual members also. No, no, the framework manages it. You don't have to worry about it. You just probably say, um, let's say you log into users and you can somehow manage to create a map here saying this client ID is this user. You can just say, send a message to that user. It won't be very hard doing that. I mean, JavaScript objects are maps. You can just straight use them. So that's basically you can use sessions. That's one of the ways. Or you can use, make, um, make sure when you're sending the message there, in the browser itself, you can send the IDs. That won't be very secure, but depends on your use case. Pardon? Oh yeah, so again, this is just like the next step after Ajax. In Ajax, you can update individual sections. Similarly, it's true here. I mean, you have a WebSocket stream open whenever data comes. It depends all on your handler. It's asynchronous. It's just like XHR. It's completely asynchronous. When the callback happens, you can either change the complete page or change section of the page. That's up to you. It doesn't deal with the DOM itself. It doesn't deal at all with the DOM. It just gives you a callback. You do whatever you want to do with your DOM. It doesn't do anything with your DOM. Yeah. So there are few frameworks and few lab few libraries for Node that are right on top of Socket.io, which let you do things like that. We let you build portlets and all. And there's one thing called Node uh, Now.js, uh, which lets you if you create a method function on the server side, uh, it serializes that function sends it to the client, the client evaluates it, and puts a function there. So on the server side, you just have to say um, this function, and it automatically executes. It's like RPC. Right. So all those things are possible. Right. You, so you can, so it also has some UUIDs, but it manages them internally. You don't, you don't get them. Pardon? So I am not sure if there is a socket.io um, server available for Scala, but there is one for Java. So you can probably compile it and maybe use it. It will be a little tricky. Yep. So if you're using um, using WebSockets, I mean it's fine. It works fine around behind any proxy if you're not using WebSockets. XSR polling is not normal HTTP. It works fine. But problems start happening when you use Nginx or Apache or any of those old HTTP proxies in front of these applications. Because this WebSocket is an extension to HTTP and it will break behind a traditional HTTP proxy. So the best solution is you can use a Node.js based HTTP proxy and it works just fine. There's a website called Nodester which is a free Node.js hosting platform and they host about 2000 applications on them. They've been uh, serving a lot of web, uh, WebSocket applications, it just works fine. So you need to use a HTTP proxy that supports WebSockets. There's the Nginx patch available. You can use that. Nodester. So it's an open source platform. 
Uh, sometimes it gets crowded and low on resources. You can just clone it, deploy it on your own EC2 machine. You have your own Node.js platform. So it's a git to push, like git push to deploy. You just code, push, and it automatically restarts your application. That's the thing. You don't use Node.js for serving huge data or serving or doing computation, computer, computation intensive applications, right? So basically, it's a file on the, on the local system. Okay. And say, if you're watching the file, every time there's an update to the file, it needs to be broadcasted. Okay. What you can do is instead, um, don't use WebSockets for that. Um, so there's a thing called server sent events. Um, but then that's supported in yeah, let's say if that, it's not there. Let's say if it's not there. You can use socket.io to send an event saying the file is updated, please do a get request and pull the file. So that's not push. Yeah, so you don't, it's, it's an immediate message and the server pulls it himself. He's not polling, right? Solves the purpose and you're not uh, hogging the resources for socket.io. It's a push poll. Yeah, it's a push initiated poll, which is a, which is a big deal. I mean, you know, let's say you have a um, ROM on your phone which needs to be updated every two, three days. Uh, your server will say the new ROM is available. I mean, you, a persistent connection just gets a notification. Another connection will get opened to just pull the data. You don't, you don't want, you wouldn't never want to uh, push a lot of data on a WebSocket stream. Essentially, the idea behind this is giving control to the server for pushing data. I mean, it's fine if it's a push-based pull or whatever. When the server has a control and can control probably like um, grouping requests together, let's say if, instead of send, sending one or two requests at a time, um, or let's say you have a um, home page like Yahoo homepage or any of those older home pages, and this has some 500 modules. Not every user is using all the modules, right? The server can just say, these modules are updated. The client says, I am interested only in these four modules. I'll pull only these four. So you update only those four. The server just says what all is updated. So you don't, remember, don't push hundreds of MBs on WebSocket stream. It's not meant for that. So when you create um, a WebSocket stream, you have to serialize information. When you have to serialize information, especially binary data, you have to put it in memory, right? 100 MB serialized will probably bloat up much more. Binary to serialized. I mean, the, I mean, you have to decide the limit based on your traffic and your server capabilities. Pardon? You put more RAM if you want to have push 100 MB, 100 KB of files. Entire, entire voice data, yeah. I mean, because you, let's say if you want to push a new image, serializing it will be very, very, in, um, for, first of all, when you serialize it, it, it will take CPU. Uh, when you uh, serialize it, it will take memory. When you do a, this push-based pull uh, thing, uh, you just have to pick it up from the file system and just send it out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Exactly. So let's say I have a web service that generates screenshots. So I send a request saying generate screenshot for this URL. It can generate the screenshot, put it on a CDN URL, and then I can fetch from there instead of sending it on the WebSocket stream. And now next time anybody requests, it can just, just directly come from the uh, CDN itself. That's a huge difference. It's microseconds, it's microseconds. You will never, never notice it. You can. You can probably even create um, a distributed map reduce system in which every browser gets a chunk of data. Uh, then they map around it, they send it back the information all through WebSockets. It's all possible. Whenever they send back data, whenever server has new data, it can push again. You can build a farm based on browsers itself. So 
exactly i mean that, that that also depends on the web servers you're using how you're using them i mean that depends on a lot of factors how you want to scale there are a lot of factors involved louder please I mean, you when you're doing any kind of request, you're managing this one ID across all WebSocket connections, right? You can actually map uh, some kind of like the transaction to that ID, right, on the server side. So it's, it's not like the traffic provider should take care of all that. You cannot take care of network glitches, can you? Yeah, so whenever you get disconnected, there's a event for that also. So here, um, this this part here, when you're saying io.sockets.on connection function client, you can here say client dot on disconnect. Ah. And you can probably just clear up the transaction, roll back it, whatever you want to do here. Yeah, the moment uh, there's a there's a timeout for it. So let's say if there is 10 seconds of a network glitch, the browser reconnects, nobody says anything, it continues. But let's say it's for 30 seconds, this will automatically happen. I think the typical thing is about two seconds or something. Yeah. You, so you can you can. By the way, you can you if you're using web sockets, you can do it over like secure SSL. You can do that. So there is uh, WSS web socket secure, or if you can do the tip, the traditional XHR and all over X, HTTPS also. So that half security is done there. If you're worried about that, any other questions? There is a little uh, timeout that's defined in the, in the spec itself. The WebSocket spec says how much time it should wait before calling the disconnect. No, I mean if you, for example, reload your, your page in the, in the Yeah, so that's definitely disconnect. You reload, reload the page, everything on that page is gone. The DOM, the connections, everything. Okay. Yeah. So you need to yeah. Every time the page loads, you have to reinstantiate the connection. Oh, that's not related to this. We'll talk about this later outside. Okay. Any other questions? You're done here? Thank you, guys. By the way, I'm Netroy on Twitter if anybody wants to follow me.